Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 196 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the recently announced and ratified Public Charge Point Regulations 2023 and what it means to you as an EV driver. Bit of a detailed one, so you might need a cup of tea and a biscuit. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I want to let you know a little more about the season-ending round table. I'm not going to be running it. Someone else is. And with that little teaser, we'll move on. Our main topic of discussion today is the Public Charge Point Regulations 2023. You may have heard about these in the media. They were put together in draft form earlier in 2023 and formed a set of standards and requirements that would need to apply to all public charge points in the UK. We'll go through the regulations in a minute, but I want to go through the background to them first. They were designed to provide a level of comfort and security for public charge point users in the country. As charge points have sprung up over the last decade or so, it's been a bit of a wild west in terms of standards, etc. For example, some charge points can be accessed with a card reader and paid for by contactless cards. Some can only be accessed and initiated via an app or a specific RFID card. Uh, There are various levels of reliability across the different networks. Some are pretty much rock solid when it comes to reliability, others less so. Naturally, This caused an amount of concern for people, especially those who were hesitant about moving forward with an EV purchase. If you can't rely on the chargers and you need a different app for every operator, it becomes a lot more of a hassle than staying with petrol or diesel. So the regulations were drafted. Basically, the regulations have four main areas of focus. Payment processing, where they cover items such as contactless payments and payment roaming. Performance requirements, where they set levels for charger reliability and regular reporting and the creation of a 24-7 helpline. Open public charge point data, where they discuss access to underlying data for charge points. And pricing transparency, where they discuss displaying units of measurements as well as price per kilowatt hour. Of course, within each of these areas is where the detail is and the devil is absolutely in the details and we'll get to that in a short while. But first, let's go through each of these in turn. We'll start with payment processing. As has been requested for a long, long time, these regulations mandate that all charges in the UK should be accessible by anyone with a simple contactless payment card. But here's the devil in this one. Only if the charger has a power output of 8 kilowatts or higher. Yes, that's right, your standard 7 kilowatt destination charger are not eligible for this. So they can stay at all RFID base, which will be good for companies like Podpoint who have a lot of these. The interesting question comes when you have 11 or 22 kilowatt AC chargers, such as the ones you might find at hospitals, for example. These are often co-located with lower power chargers, such as the 7 kilowatt ones, which means the CPO will either need to make them all contactless or restrict the speed so that the 11 and 22 kilowatt ones are derated to 7 kilowatt. The issue with contactless is that it's actually quite a big expense, as well as the cost of the the card readers themselves, There's a cost associated with processing each payment, and that all has to be accounted for in the price of the charge. Now, there is a workaround for this, however. The regulations allow for one payment unit for multiple charge units. This means, in theory, you could have any number of charge points which all use the same card reader to provide payment. Maybe this will save some money, maybe not. And I know that seems a little weird, but it does already exist in a slightly altered form for at least one particular charger that I know. In West Slough, there's an Osprey site which is both a rapid DC charger and a separate standalone AC unit. But control of the AC unit is integrated into the screen of the DC unit. So if you want to charge AC, and why wouldn't you? It's located in a retail park with a reasonable dwell time. You need to plug your car in at the AC, head across to the DC unit, make your payment, and initiate the charge from there. Now, I'm interested in how Tesla are planning to do this. They don't have payment terminals on their V1, V2, and V3 supercharger units. They do have them on the V4 units, 
which means they have three alternatives. Retrofit payment terminals to all the V1, 2 and 3 units, replace all the older units with V4 devices, or remove public access to any unit that doesn't have a payment terminal. If they choose the latter option, this will lower the number of public access Tesla sites down dramatically. At the time of recording, there's only two sites which have V4 units and are open to non-Tesla drivers. Uh, Tesla superchargers, by the way, are only open to Tesla drivers and don't fall under these requirements as they're deemed to be private networks. Let's move on and talk about payment roaming. Do you remember when I spoke with Adrian Keane from Interval in an earlier episode? I asked him about roaming. Roaming is an interesting one, and we've, we've wrestled with this quite a lot over the years. But go back to our ethos that EV charging should be easy. All of us have either a contact with payment card, debit card, credit card, or Apple, iPhones with Apple Pay, Google Pay. And that's the easiest, most painless way of accessing public charging. And we wanted to move away from the RFID app trap that so many users felt was frustrating. And I know they weren't affiliated with any roaming service at that time. What they couldn't tell me then, and I've subsequently learned, was that uh, Adrian had already signed a deal with the Octopus Electrofirst network to provide roaming of their charges. But he did make it clear, and I've spoken to him since then to confirm this, that they don't expect to, ex to expand their roaming connection to any other service. Bear that in mind as we talk about the second provision of the charging regulations, roaming services. It says that within a certain time period of these regulations coming into play, the charge point operators must ensure that a person using any of its charge points is able to pay to charge an electric vehicle using a payment service provided by a third party roaming provider. What it doesn't mandate is which third party operator it should be and whether charge point operators have to be signed up to all third party roaming operators. What this means is that from a roaming point of view, Instavolt has fulfilled the letter of the law here. With ZapPay, Electrofirst, Bonnet, Ellie, and others, there are numerous roaming services. Some are app-based, some are card-based, some have both. Personally, and I've said it before on this podcast, I really wish all CPOs would sign up to all roaming services. I don't really care which service I have. I want the ability to use the same one across all the devices in use. Moving on, we come to provisions about reliability. Now, we've discussed reliability numerous times on the show, and we know there are operators who are very reliable and those who are less so. The new regulations state that the network of rapid charge points is, on average, reliable for 99% of the time during each calendar year. Now, there's a lot to unpick here. First off, it relates only to rapid charges. So AC destination charges, whether 7-11 or 22 kilowatt, are exempt from this regulation. Secondly, it talks about having an average reliability, which is a can of worms in itself. Thirdly, it has an interesting definition of what reliable is. So let's go through that. If I have 200 charging stations in my network and two of them are permanently broken all year, as long as the other 198 are 100% available, this means I've met the requirement. But it also means that if the charger I rely on as an EV driver is one of those two that are permanently broken. I'm never going to be able to use it. Now, that's plainly wrong. The regulations shouldn't refer to an average across the network. They should refer to individual units. If I were to attempt a wild analogy, if you were in hospital linked to a ventilator and all the other ventilators in the hospital worked correctly but yours didn't, the fact the administrator can come out and say, well, our average reliability is 99%, doesn't hold much sway, right? Well, now let's look at what reliable means in this context. According to the regulations, a rapid charge point is considered to be reliable for the purposes of calculating compliance with the reliable, reliability requirement, where it is either working, i.e. the charger is indicated as available charging or reserve, or that charger is not eligible to be included in the reliability measurement because it's either in an unknown status or blocked. So let's analyze that a little. If I'm in the Highlands of Scotland and I need a nice Charge Place Scotland charge to get my Nissan Leaf to the Airbnb, I come across it to find that because it's out in the wilds of Scotland with poor phone connection, it's flagged on the system as having an unknown status. Even if that unit cannot actually charge my car, it's deemed to be reliable. Now, I'm not sure what blocked means in this case, but I'm assuming it means that the battery 
charger unit is up and working, you cannot physically access the unit because, for example, a contractor has put barriers up to dig up the road nearby, or there's a lorry parked across the bay and the adjacent one, or, and this is a doozy, you're accessing a unit in a wheelchair, but because it's in a very tight parking bay at a fast food restaurant, and you know who I'm talking about, you physically cannot get to the unit to use it. As far as you're concerned, it's unusable. As far as the system's concerned, it's fine. According to the provisions of the regulations, a charger is deemed to be unreliable if it's flagged as having the status of in inoperative or out of order. Another can of worms here, I think. What determines whether a battery charger is inoperative? What does out of order mean? I was at a bank of Instafault chargers recently. A driver came in and tried to start the unit with his contactless card. The reader wasn't working. Is that charging station classed as inoperative? No, because it is still working and the charge could be initiated by someone using the app or a roaming card, which is what happened to the next driver to walk up there. But as far as that first driver was concerned, he didn't have the app or roaming card. He only had contactless, which after all is the, the main selling point from Instavolt, as stated by Adrian Keane on this very show. So as far as the driver was concerned, that charger was inoperative. The regulations would deem it to be working fine. What happens if a charger accepts payment, starts charging, but the power being sent from that charger to the car is something ridiculous like two kilowatts, as happened recently to someone in the US at an Electrify America unit? Is that charger deemed to be operational, reliable, available? Or how about an esoteric one, but one which happened to me when I had the Kia Soul? The Soul uses the Chadamo connector. What happens if I rock up to a charger with both Chadamo and CCS connectors, but the Chadamo connector is broken? As a sole driver, I cannot get a charge there. But as an ID3 driver, I can. Is that inoperative, out of order or not? And that's going to cause issues, I reckon. Oh, um, we'll come back to that particular uh, example later on. The next provision talks about reporting reliability. CPOs have to report the reliability of their charges for the previous year by the 14th of January of the following year. This report must show the number of rapid charge points operated over the year, the overall reliability percentage as mandated in the previous provision, and the reliability of each charge point split by status, available, charging, reserved, unknown, or blocked. That's a more useful figure, but it doesn't say what the government are going to do with that data. In our fictional scenario of a charge being out of order all year, but the overall percentage still matching 99%, what will the outcome be the charge point operator. It's not clear. Next, we have the helpline. This is a no-brainer. Most charge point operators have it anyway. The regulations call for having a clearly marked helpline number manned 24-7 free of charge to the consumer. Where this differs from the current situation is in the area of reporting. The Secretary of State now wants anonymized data by quarter indicating the total number of calls received during the relevant quarter a breakdown of the calls categorized by type of assistance sought, a breakdown of the calls categorized by the length of time in 10 minute intervals it took to resolve those calls, and the percentage of calls which were not resolved by the date on which the report was submitted, and a list of reasons why those calls are still not resolved. Now, this will certainly hold the charge point operator's feet to the fire when it comes to understanding what issues are key for users. But as we know from chatting with charge point operators on the show, the vast majority of calls to helplines are due to an inability to either start or stop the charge. Most of these are a lack of knowledge or unfamiliarity at that particular moment. I mean, how many people do you know who turn up at a charger that's clearly broken or not working, don't even attempt to charge, but still call the helpline to say it's broken? I don't know many, do you? Hopefully the stats will reflect this. The next provision talks about data. And this segment is, I think, the part where the most important changes are being made. This provision basically says that the availability and reliability data that the charge point operator gathers must be made available in a machine readable form to the public free of charge. Now, this is reasonably game changing because now members of the general public and competing charge point operators can see the status of individual favorite slash troublesome slash local charges. This lets the public holder charge point operators to feet to the fire, although 
in the case of certain charge point operators, we know that they know how bad they are and they don't seem to mind people telling them. So not entirely sure what difference this will make, but that's a, an, an aside. My main concern, and one I know has been expressed by others on forums, which I visit, is the ability to game the system with data. As an example, we've already discussed the fact that a charge is not eligible to be included in the reliability measurement because it's either in an unknown status or blocked. It's easy enough for a charge point operator to monitor the statistics and selectively take charges offline, i.e. put them into an unknown status. And at this point, we need to start talking about some fairly esoteric things such as OCPP and OCPI. Uh, OCPP is the Open Charge Point Protocol. OCPI is the Open Charge Point Interface Protocol. OCPP is the application protocol for communication between the electric vehicle charging stations and a central management system. And OCPI supports connections between e-mobility service providers who have an EV drivers as customers and charge point operators who manage charge stations. There are two reasonably technical sets of standards which will, in theory, allow the charge point data to be mapped into a form accessible by everyone. But again, the devil is in the details with this. Oh, sidebar, if you want to inform yourself of the OCPI standards, the 184-page PDF with the technical specs is linked in the show notes. Enjoy. Discussions I've had with various interested parties indicate that even though these two aspects of the whole system are aligned, there is potential for things to become, when we say confused, let's take a typical example. If I have a rapid charger at a specific location and it has an AC cable and two DC cables, Chatham and CCS, how does OCPI think of that? Well, the protocol says that a connector is a specific socket or cable, cable available for the EV to make use of. An EVSE is the part that controls the power supply to a single EV in a single session. An EVSE may provide multiple connectors, but only one of these can be active at the same time. And a location is a group of one or more EVSEs that belong together geographically or spatially. That means I have one location with one EVSE and one connector, as only one of the DC units can be used at one time. So far, so good. But what if this was a dual charge unit? That means I have one location, two EVSEs, and two connectors. So in the first case, and casting your mind back to the example I gave earlier with the CCS connector working and the CHAdeMO connector not, this means that the unit will be marked as working because that connector works, albeit for CCS only, even though the other cable attached to that connector, CHAdeMO, wasn't working. But there's also a disconnect between definitions of various statuses. Remember when I said there are specific statuses which are recognized as available for a charge point? This includes unknown status. Well, my understanding is that how the OCPP determines this status and how it maps that to the OCPI statuses, state I, might not be as clear cut as we originally anticipated. In other words, it might, and I stress might, be possible for a device to be not working in reality but showing as unknown as far as the publicly available data is concerned. As I say, can of worms, devil in the details. Let's move on to pricing. The next provision talks about displaying the total price per kilowatt hour either on the charger or on a device which can be accessed without signing up on a contract. This price must be clear and it mustn't change once the charging has started. In theory, it's a no brainer. You check out the charger, ZapMap or some other app, and you say, oh, 75 pence kilowatt hour. But let's consider our friends at Shell Recharge. They've recently added a transaction fee to every charge, 35 pence a charge capped at seven pounds per month. In theory, this means the price for the charge is not the same as the price per kilowatt hour multiplied by the number of kilowatt hours delivered. So how does this work? Once more, it can't be displayed in advance. If they were to split the transaction fee amongst the number of kilowatt hours you were receiving, they wouldn't be able to calculate this until you've finished charging, which means the price of per kilowatt hour effectively changes during the charge. Now, also, we've talked about spot pricing on the show before. That's the ability to determine the price of a kilowatt hour by pulling in the market price of electricity at the time the charge starts 
then adding a markup to, to cover costs and billing the user on that basis. Now, if you're charging in the middle of the night or at times of high renewables, it's great. But many of these spot prices change every half hour, which means if you're charging for longer than 30 minutes, the price per kilowatt hour will change mid-charge. That contravenes the regulations. Now, obviously that's not an issue right now. It might become one one day. The interesting part of this, and the one that will focus the charge point operators more than anything, is the penalty system. For each transgression on a network, the owner is fined £10,000. So if an operator has five units that can't be accessed via a roaming service, they'll be fined £10,000 per unit. If an operator has a unit where the contactless payment is not available, it will be fined £10,000 for each transgression. If a network has a thousand units, <coughs> Tesla, and they don't have contactless cards, this could be an issue. Although, as I said earlier, Tesla don't all fall under the regulations because some of their charges are uh, unique to Tesla owners only and not, not open to the general public. Now, these regulations were made, as the parlance goes, on the 2nd of November 2023, and they came into force on the 24th of November 2023. The provisions within the regulations apply to charges and charge point operators immediately, although most of them grant up to a year to get these in place. Basically, the intention is that new charges are installed, complete with working contactless solutions, but older ones have 12 months grace to retrofit. Now, I see this as a step in the right direction, but I want to believe that CPOs won't game the system to try and avoid the fines that come with non-adherence. Is that just a cynic in me? We'll see. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. A wind turbine with a difference. There's a giant battery in a container that uses a kite to recharge itself. The kite power Hawk combines a few key elements. The first is a 400 kilowatt hour battery pack inside a shipping container, which comprises a storage and distribution part of the system. The second is a kite, which is attached to the end of a tether. And as the wind pulls the kite into the air in an elaborate flight pattern designed to maximize the direction of the pull cycle, that pulling force unwinds the reel. The resultant mechanical force, very much like the spinning of a wind turbine, is then harvested as electricity. Finally, the system then uses electricity to pull the kite back in, but in a straight line trajectory that uses far less power than the pulling force generates. Tests indicate that it can generate at 40 kilowatts when unreeling and through various bits of physics and mechanics only uses 10 kilowatts to rewind. It spends 10% of its time unreeling and 20% of its time rolling back. So overall, it produces the net equivalent of 30 kilowatts of continuous power when in operation. Island communities, remote work sites and seasonal agriculture are all potential areas where a solution like this could be used. I like the idea, wind generation with a difference. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at the new email, which is info at evmusings.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this episode, buy me a coffee. Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of books out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So you've got an electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p equivalent. And it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So you've got Renewable. It's also available on Amazon for the same 99p. And it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. <clears throat> Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings TV with the words, the devil's in the details. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he's discovered micropayments as a way of funding his lifestyle. Watch a few seconds of his videos, pay to watch the rest. It's fun and games. As he has people watching all over the world and in many different age groups, I wondered how some of the younger kids in places like Colombia and Vietnam would end up funding his lifestyle. He told me, All of us have either a contact with payment card, debit card, credit card, Apple, iPhones, without pay, Google Pay. Thanks for listening. Bye.